Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Philippe Guinot. I'm from PASS. And this is my pleasure to welcome you to this session this afternoon on a UHC and the road to 2023, how we're achieving universal health coverage. We are now one year away uh, from this high-level meeting on UHC in 2023. Some progress have been made, no doubt about that, but the road ahead is still very long and very bumpy. And unless we accelerate the pace, I think we can all agree that the likelihood of being successful with this goal is pretty low at this stage. While we can consider it's only a goal, we should not forget that there are patients behind this goal and that actually we need working health systems that are able to cater for those patient needs. This is time for us to bring focus and to bring action. Partnership will be crucial because it's a multi-sectoral endeavor, uh, this UHC 20, uh, 2030. And this is why we've got panelists coming from very different background and experience. What has worked so far, what has not, how can partnership help us go further and achieve this goal uh, will be the topic of our discussion today. By keeping our focus on universal access and universal access of quality healthcare, and I insist on quality. If we just aim for universal access without quality, we are achieving nothing. Access to health is a right, and this is a critical determinant to economic development. We cannot uh, dream for countries to develop without appropriate uh, access to, uh, to healthcare. All of our panelists today have strong expertise, they also have a lot to say, so I'll move ahead uh, with the discussion and I'll introduce them. I'll ask them a question, they'll answer, and there will be time uh, at the end for questions from the audience with closing remarks from our panelists. Uh, so my first question will be uh, to Gabriela Cueva Baron, uh, the co-chair of the steering committee for UHC 2030. Gabriela, from UHC 2030 steering committee viewpoint, where do we stand one year prior to this uh, uh, high-level meeting in 2023? What has been working? Where are we not making progress fast enough and why? Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you all for joining us today. Well, we all know about the 2030 agenda on the SDG3, but then we got the UHC resolution, uh, the political declaration in 2019, a very ambitious uh, uh, declaration that committed all the world to a single road for having universal health coverage. But then a pandemic came to the table. And apparently so far, we are not being able to learn the lesson that 18 million deaths left to us to learn. And this means that we, we failed to protect the people. We failed in our health systems. We didn't make our homework. Because if we were able to achieve UHC, people could have been able to go to their clinics and to have tests and to have a, a rapid detection. And of course, our private sector could have had more instruments and information if we were able to cooperate uh, with each other. We can see that during the pandemic, the governments decided to close their borders and people decided to run to the supermarkets and get food without carrying each other in many latitudes. I mean, not all of them. We have amazing lessons of solidarity in some regions, but some others that we should be learning. The pandemic also exposed the terrible inequalities that the world already had before that. But we need to fight against those inequalities. And the first homework that we have to deliver here is to guarantee health services, quality health services for all people everywhere. If we do not have access to health, how are we going to achieve other uh, SDGs? If we do not have health, 
How are we going to have a decent job? How are we going to have housing? How are we going to have food? So health is a must if we really want to change the world. Based on our review of the state of commitments in 45 countries in 2021, many countries have agreed on having a strong national commitments. There are countries that are really focused on achieving UHC and they are setting priorities. But there are also uh, important innovations that happened precisely because of the pandemic. Not, so, not so everything was terrible news. Innovations in terms of vaccines, in terms of treatments, in terms of the need of cooperation. And I believe that also we learned that we can uh, have a, a stronger work and commitment with our health systems. But on the other hand, we need to understand that it is not only to have a commitment, we need also to deliver a strategy. And one of the most important challenges now and for the next year is going to be the possible economic recession that the world could be facing. We need, of course, uh, uh, and I think the first point is political leadership. We are always saying that we want to change the world. Yes, how? We need politicians at the table. We, if we want to translate international commitments to local realities, we need to build a bridge. And that bridge includes, yes, regional organization, but that includes national governments and even subnational governments. If there is political will and political leadership, then we can continue taking many other decisions. The second one is that we need financing. Uh, I used to be a parliamentarian for many years, and we used to say that uh, true love is only shown in budget. So <laughs> if someone is promising you eternal love, but that's not reflected in budget, that's only campaigning. So we need financing, and financing mean co means cooperation. It means uh, including civil society and private sector. It means that 2023 is going to be really challenging for us who wants to change the world. The third issue is that we need implementation plans. Yes, let's see, we changed our constitution and now universal health coverage is a human right. Then we change legislation. That's complicated, but it can happen and how it is translated to public policy, how it goes to private sector, how it goes to civil society to be included, how it goes to community level. Um, we need also to, to bring all groups in society to the table. If we really want to, to fight vulnerabilities and we are understanding that inequity uh, uh, killed a lot of people during the pandemic, we need to fight it. It is the government's duty to give equal opportunities to everyone. And that's a human right, not a political choice. Uh, we need also to bring health workers to the table. We cannot continue <laughs> deciding about health without those who are fighting at the front line, especially women. Six, uh, women and girls. We need to talk about women and girls in health. And that includes from the, the health workers and all the way to the patients and the specific needs. Seven, civil society. Sometimes at the poorest communities, at the poorest level, the most vulnerable communities are only protected by true heroes, civil society. Sometimes with their own resources, with their own time and dedicating their personal lives. And finally, we need to establish new partnerships. If we are not able to work together, it is going to be very difficult to change the world. Next year in 2023, we are going to have three different UN high-level meetings. One dedicated to UHC, another to tuberculosis, and the third one, the third one to PPR. We need to understand that everything is interrelated that we have to care about placing people at the center of all decisions. And that means that we have to collaborate to be sure that 
all our goals are reflected in the three high level meetings and we make a difference to make 2023 the moment where we are uh, not only reviewing the progress, but also renewing our enthusiasm, our passion, our hearts to make a difference in health and to be sure that we are going to warranty health for all as a human right. Health is not a privilege. Health is a human right. And next year in 2023, I'm sure that we can be able to make that happen. Thank you very much, Philippe, for this table and for the invitation. Gabriela, thanks so much for your remarks. Thanks a lot for your passion uh, for UHC 2030. This is really energizing. And uh, uh, yes, we will need partnership. Yes, governments will not be able alone uh, to achieve uh, 2030. And uh, in that spirit, I'd like now to turn to our second spe uh, speaker, uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Kwame Yeboa, who represents Christian Health Association of Ghana. Uh, and they've been doing a tremendous uh, work in Ghana around access to health, which is a human right, which we should never forget about. Peter, from a country perspective, does the assessment of the gains and setback highlighted by Gabriela resonate? And can you give us an example of where partnerships are working, but also where partnership is not working and what's holding uh, this relationship with the government and the partner uh, uh, back from making it to work? Peter, over to you. Yes, uh, many thanks, Philip. Thank you, Gabriela, for the passion. Now it's time for a reality check. Is there. Uh, certainly, I understand that achieving UAC remains aspirational. It's not something that can happen overnight. It requires collaboration. There are many steps and there are many intermediate milestones that need to be attained. But in terms of real gains beyond the hype of UAC and heightened awareness of UAC, I think we are far behind and we should concede on that. The stakes are incredibly high, and indeed the consequences of not achieving UAC means loss of lives, most of the costs which are avoidable. And it means that we are denying people of their right to live a productive, inclusive life. And so there's an imperative sense of urgency for us to attain UAC. And Carella, you're also right to suggest that much of the responsibility for attaining UAC rests on the shoulders of the government, you mentioned political leadership, but you also right to suggest that government alone can never ever achieve UAC if it is to become a reality by the year 2030. And that is why effective partnership, intentional engagement of key stakeholders are necessary if we are to attain UAC. In my country, Ghana, we have a template for partnership, which I would like to share with you. Um, in the history of Ghana, there have been church-state partnership, which have existed uh, pre-independence and post-independence era. It is a partnership for health targeted at bridging health inequalities. And it is structured in such a way that it is a government through the Ministry of Health that sets the national agenda. And once the agenda is set, all stakeholders, partners, agencies, and actors are supposed to align their vision and mission in health around government's agenda, which is expressed in what is called health sector medium-term development plan. So meaning that all program of work should be aligned with that. And indeed, within this partnership framework, the Christian Health Association of Ghana, which is the second largest provider of health services with 347 health facilities, is recognized as an agency or an implementing partner of the government. We are included in government's or Ministry of Health policy decisions, health sector medium term, um, uh, health sector working group meeting, we are there. And the highest policy making body is called Interagency Leadership Committee, which Chad is part of that. In fact, we are also recognized as an autonomous entity within this arrangement. And later, I will demonstrate how this autonomy grants us the space for us to innovate the space for us to complement government's efforts. And indeed, about 40,000 staff of CHAG are paid by government working in the rural area. So this partnership has inured 
to several benefits, complementing the overall government agenda in improving access to health services. First and foremost, because government supports CHAC, we are able to operate in rural areas, underserved um, areas of Ghana, and on rich populations. One, because of our autonomy, we are also able to innovate. Indeed, Ghana's National Health Insurance Scheme, which is a flagship program in Africa, began by CHAG pioneering or piloting community-based health insurance schemes in the early 90s that provided proof of concept for government to adopt it in the, year, in, in the 2000s. Not only that, we are able to come up with several innovations at the moment CHAG is um, piloting with safe care quality improvement program and then digital innovations such as made for all supply chain, that digital supply chain systems to address issues of price variations, stockouts and quality, which is an important component of that. And we are doing that under the auspices of pharmacists and together some of the programs are demonstrating high yields, so much so that the Ghana Air Service has adopted some of these innovations. So overall, our partnership is nearing to several advantages. And ultimately, with barely 7.5% of the health infrastructure in Ghana, CHAG is able to provide 30 to 40% of health services across board. And so we are able to complement government efforts and ultimately improve access to quality, affordable health services to generations, geography, and of course, to gender, very particular about women and children all over. And so I tell this excellent partnership between the church and the state, Ministry of Health and CHAG as one template worth emulating. And in Africa, it is one of a kind where Christian Health Association is recognized as a partner, autonomous within the government entity. The government supports it and is able to provide persons at a policy table and impact. But then beyond this excitement about our partnership, it is not all that rosy. There are certain reality checks that we have to concede. And what are some of the challenges that I have to uh, highlight? The first challenge that I have to is, is that equity issue. Even though we are recognized as partners, there's also sometimes this subtle public-private competition mm. for resources, for projects and programs. And often, even though the ministry will recognize us, but when it comes to implementation, of course, you are seen as a private. These are some of the personal challenges that we have. The second challenge has to do with functional disconnect amongst the 23 agencies of the Ministry of Health from service delivery, regulation, and funding uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme. And I'll highlight some of these challenges for us to appreciate. The first has to do with the fact that you have resources oftentimes um, geared towards government facilities, and oftentimes you have duplication, siting of facilities close in close proximity to child facilities. Clearly, this is duplication of roles, dissipation of resources, which could be really uh, addressed. You also have regulation, which I describe as selective regulation of faith-based health providers. In fact, the highest standard of regulation are sometimes imposed on faith-based providers, mm -hmm. and you have a bit of lazity in government facilities, and you wonder if you are to achieve universal health coverage, there should be standards of care applicable to all citizens of the country that are there. And then let me also highlight uh, what, I, what I described as the unintended consequences of the National Health Insurance Scheme. Our National Health Insurance Scheme is structured for sick care. In other words, it is skewed against cost-effective primary health care interventions. So disease uh, prevention or preventive and promotive services sometimes suffer at the mercy of that. And indeed, this is one of the challenges that could be addressed. And in a sense, it also affects provider autonomy to innovate or to come out with you know, priority interventions and services that will promote health and healing at all levels. One other challenge that cut across beyond government or with partners is trust. We understand the essence of trust and trust is a social capital. And trust is often objectified by robust accountability systems in terms of having uh, appropriate financial management systems, internal control systems, auditing, and accountability transparency are very needed. But the challenge has to do with physician with financial accountability. Financial accountability is about receipts. It's about uh, not looking at intermediate aspects of um, equitable distribution of resources, 
efficient use of resources, and of course, ensuring accountability. But behind every dollar is a human life. It is time for us to transition from financial accountability to outcome-based accountability to see what are the real impacts of our investment, high yield. This is a moment that also requires uh, for us to recognize the autonomy, flexibility. And the challenge often has to do with EMR funding. EMR funding have their own KPIs, sometimes different reporting systems, accountability systems. And we often will have to spend more time with accounting for that receipts. And so we believe that if partnership is to work, it will require innovation. We have to harness resources properly. And I believe strongly that it is time that first recognize that the ultimate goal is to improve access to quality affordable health services across gender generations. And then of course, ensure that no one is left behind. And this is where I would like to end, Philip, by highlighting the essence of leadership. We need effective leadership. And we believe that achieving UAC requires government leadership. But of course, government leadership doesn't mean country, I mean, it means that country ownership. Government could legislate to re regulate, but we need a convening platform where all key stakeholders will come together and complement government efforts. Government alone can never do anything. We need to resource other factors. We are also talking about collaboration. We need joint mapping of needs and identification of gaps so that it will enhance inclusion in the space of UAC. In terms of mobilization, assignment of roles and responsibility, if we can harness synergies and ensure buy-in, we need effective collaboration. And of course, resources. Equitable distribution or allocation of resources, I cannot emphasize that, especially to partners with demonstrated capacity to perform and attain the high yields that are done. And I also expect finally that donors, our partners, should trust. If we don't have the context, we definitely cannot define appropriate content. Partners at the local level with demonstrated capacity should be trusted to innovate, meaningful innovation to impact the entire health sector. And I'd like to say that if we also innovate, we need to create the right enable environment. Rigidity is definitely not a pathway, but we have to create an environment for people to innovate all over. It is only by having this shift that universal health coverage will be attained and ultimately accountability for resources should be made in terms of extent to which population coverage, service coverage, quality are harnessed. Partnership is the key. Definitely, it is indispensable if UAC is to become a reality. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Peter. Really inspiring and if budget uh, reflects true love. Uh, actually, uh, uh, you make a very convincing argument for countries to be in the day deciding, in the driver's seat, uh, to decide how to uh, focus their efforts when it comes to public health. I think uh, uh, too often uh, we lack trust and uh, country and uh, ministries of health uh, have clear plans on what is uh, uh, needed for their countries. And I think uh, it's important that we all listen and support those plans rather than at time trying to uh, uh, go vertical because that's what we know how to do best. And while vertical is essential to keep focus, uh, we will achieve universal health coverage only by building resilient health system. And I think that's gonna be a critical point. Not only do we need resilient health system, but we also need innovation. And we need innovation for um, neglected uh, uh, disease for uh, areas where uh, the uh, everyone uh, is not able to invest on their own because of risk, because of a small market. And uh, some diseases are less attractive than others uh, to traditional drug development actors, and they remain neglected. As such, uh, different models have been developed and uh, uh, DNDI is a drug neglected disease initiative is a perfect example of that. Uh, this organization have a great role to play. And I'm now turning to uh, Luis Pizarro as uh, a new CEO or recent CEO uh, of uh, DNDI. Luis, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, and thank you very much for PATH to, to invite us to present today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you said, I'm uh, director of DNDI, that it's uh, uh, an organization uh, almost 20 years now working on research and development uh, for drugs for uh, neglected tropical diseases. So if uh, you allow me, I would like maybe start by this and saying how neglected tropical diseases, uh, I think are a very, very good test uh, to see if universal health coverage exists uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, we were even going, I would say, beyond the term of disease and talking about neglected population because uh, those diseases affect uh, people, uh, we say poorest of the poor, that live uh, in a very uh, remote areas uh, that uh, face stigma a lot of time by those diseases. And I would like to say that because I realize we're two South American here uh, with my colleague from Mexico, I'm from Chile, that even it's not about, you know, North and South, rich and poor, uh, those neglected populations are all around the world. And it was a surprise for me uh, starting working at DNDI, visiting Latin America in August, uh, to see that in Chile, in Argentina, in Mexico, diseases like Chagas, like Leishmaniasis, uh, are still affecting thousands and thousands of people. So we're really talking about a global uh, burden, a global issue uh, all around the world. And if we cannot uh, afford accessible, qualitative tools uh, to address those diseases for those population, we cannot say we have a universal health coverage. So uh, I would like to invite, I would say countries uh, to really take uh, NTD as a sort of test to measure if your universal health coverage uh, strategy is working or not. This is my first point. Uh, the second one is we have heard since even Saturday here, uh, sometimes a big difference between people who talk about research and development and people who talk about health system strengthening. Mm. And I think this is a wrong uh, difference and we, we need to avoid to, to go into that because what we are doing uh, when we do research and development, we start discussing with patients, with community health workers about what are their needs at the primary healthcare level, uh, at the first line. So we are going to develop new drugs, new diagnostic tests, new tools that has to fix the problems the community are really facing where they are. And if we don't do that, we're not doing our work. It's not about doing R&D because it's nice, because it's smart or whatever. It's because it address a need everybody who is in the field is really facing now. So we are contributing to a health system and it's gonna be sustainable if we succeed to take those model care and integrating them into the health system. If not, it's a vertical artificial disease oriented project that will not stay there uh, when the donors will leave. So we have uh, a very strong commitment also uh, when we work in R&D with the health system. Uh, and it's good to have in mind. And the third point, uh, and I think it's absolutely critical, and you mentioned that, uh, of course, it's about partnership. People call us product development partnerships, PDPs. Okay, I think we're more than that, but let's take it we are PDPs. Uh, well, a lot of us, MMV, working in malaria, fine diagnostic, TB Alliance in TB, and much others. But what is important here is the nature uh, of this partnership. We are, I would say, virtual R&D organizations. Those who are doing the R&D are academics, are uh, the clinicians who are doing clinical trials in the field. Uh, we collaborate with the pharma sector. We collaborate uh, with NGOs like uh, MSF and others. Uh, so, of course, uh, you know, we bring a lot of partners uh, around the table. And trust, of course, in this partnership, it's uh, absolutely important. 
but beyond trust is what sort of R&D we want to promote. And we want to promote an R&D that is open access, that is taking this access notion as a really driver of everything we're doing and make the knowledge we produce and the tools we produce become what we call common goods because they are not uh, belonging to the private sector or the public sector. They belong to all of us. So they are really common goods uh, and we need to manage them in this way. And this is a challenge I think we have uh, for the future. It's something also partnership that need to, again, I think be a little bit disruptive on the classical North South and South international development approach. We are promoting now, for instance, a dengue project. You know, dengue is in Asia, is in Africa, is in Latin America, is everywhere. And we discussed with all our colleagues uh, about this and we said, okay, the R&D agenda has to be positioned by the clinicians, the R&D people and the communities in the field. But as you said very, very well too, okay, ideas are great, but if there is no funding commitment behind, it go nowhere. So uh, if we want to change that, if we want to make a reality, this decolonizing global health uh, movement we are supporting, uh, it means that we as Chileans, uh, Asians, Africa, I mean, all of us need to commit also with concrete actions uh, to make those partnerships happen uh, and be really, you know, vocal and dynamic in this partnership. So I would like just to conclude uh, saying that we will have two important uh, international moments, uh, G7 and G20. Uh, the G7 is in Japan, the next one moving from Germany, two countries that have been advocating for universal health coverage, but that has been also advocating for neglected tropical diseases. And we would like that NTDs are considered by the G7 as a very good example of R&D uh, universal health coverage and governance and new architecture for that. So this is uh, one message I wanted to, to deliver. And the second one, as I said before, uh, this has also to be a topic for the G20 and for regional, uh, I would say, scenarios in the African Union at the Latin American level are also in Asia. The fifth, the pandemic uh, fund will be in the G20. So let's hope that NTDs will also be part of those regional and G20 agenda. Thank you very much. Luis, thanks a lot. And I think, you know, the idea of using NTDs as a proxy uh, for universal health coverage uh, is fantastic. I think also this concept of global goods for, for which everyone needs to align and collaborate, and it's not North-South, it's actually everyone and everyone impacted uh, is going to be critical. And uh, uh, DNDI, through your network uh, of a partner and research partner, you've illustrated that extremely well. So let's hope that the fifth will be a resource well enough and I think you know the pledges are a bit low compared to uh, uh, the needs so far uh, but uh, gives us great hope there. If there's a, a NTDs as a proxy I think there's another proxy which <laughs> uh, uh, sadly could be looked at it's actually non-communicable disease and and there uh, they are simply assumed to be a burden of middle and uh, high income countries and we tend to forget that uh, we've got enormous uh, uh, chunks of population suffering from NCDs unaddressed, undiagnosed, untreated uh, across uh, low and medium income countries. And uh, donors so far has been uh, pretty slow to come to the party, uh, yet uh, those NCDs are uh, absolute killers in, in the country and represent a burden uh, that goes way beyond uh, what uh, we uh, currently imagine. And everywhere you go, when you uh, speak with ministries of health, they will tell you number one priority is non-communicable disease. And uh, I think here yeah, we, we need to listen. That's my pleasure uh, <laughs> to introduce uh, Alison Cox from the NCD Alliance. Uh, we will be telling us more about NCDs and the road to UHC and where we stand in NCDs. 
Um, so yes, I'm going to paint a quick picture of the burden of NCDs to illustrate that point about why they need to be at the heart of universal health coverage if it's going to be truly universal. Um, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, include cancer, diabetes, heart and lung disease, neurological and mental health conditions. Uh, they account for 74% of deaths worldwide, that's 41 million deaths. And that figure is tragically due to rise to about 52 million by 2030. And you're right, they're not just deaths in old age. 15 million of those deaths are people living under the age of 30, 70. And they're not just diseases in high income countries. You're right, Philippe. 85% um, of those deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they're due to be the number one cause of death by the end of this decade. Um, also related to COVID, um, it's estimated that 60 to 90 percent of COVID deaths have been of people living with NCDs. Um, and the excess deaths of people living with NCDs during the pandemic due to disruption of services um, um, serves to just illustrate why this was a syndemic not a pandemic. And pandemic preparedness really requires investment in he healthier populations as a whole and, and stronger health services. Since 2011, across three high-level meetings and a sustainable development goals target of 3.4, the world's government have committed again and again to reducing these deaths of the under of people under 70 from NCDs by a third. And in 2019, at the UN high level meeting on universal health coverage, men, uh, member states committed to scale up efforts and further strengthen efforts to address NCDs as part of UHC. But to give you a glimpse of the woefully poor picture uh, of how NCDs are, are not covered by um, health services just now, let me just do some quick examples through the three pillars of universal health coverage. The first pillar is good quality essential health services across the continuum of care are available according to need. And to give an example of a gap in a very basic uh, NCD treatment, which we would take as a presumed uh, in higher income countries, high blood pressure uh, affects 1.3 billion adults uh, between the ages of 30 and 79 worldwide. Two thirds of those people uh, with high blood pressure live in low and middle income countries. And globally, blood pressure is actually controlled in fewer than one in four women and one in five men with the condition. The second pillar is equity in access to health services, uh, whereby the entire population is covered, not only those who can afford services. Um, so again, to give you another very specific example from NCDs, only one in 20 adults with diabetes living in low and middle income countries reported having had their needs for recommended treatments fully met, according to a WHO report. And half of people living with diabetes do not have access to the insulin they need to survive 100 years after its discovery, as, as was pointed out yesterday. And the third pillar is financial risk protection mechanisms are in place to ensure the cost of Care, using care does not put people at risk of financial hardship. Well, out-of-pocket spending per visit is estimated to be twice as high for non-communicable diseases than for communicable diseases. And in some populations, over 60% of people living with NCDs have experienced catastrophic health expenditure, pushing them into extreme poverty. So partnerships uh, is the theme of the, the panel. There's an immense challenge involved in filling the gaps between the disease, disease burden and the, and the access to, to care needed. And the lack of domestic resources and the international donor funding is av that's available is well documented. So it, it seems obvious, as I think somebody said, that partnerships are going to be part of the solution, tapping into all possible resources and working smarter together across uh, multiple sectors and stakeholders. Uh, and certainly in our new five-year strategy, the NCD Alliance positioned partnerships as a real core function and pathway within our work. Um, and partnerships needed, are needed to across a whole aspect, a range of aspects from advocacy and policy making, service delivery and implementation, product development and uh, market shaping, research, um, et cetera. Uh, and for each of these requires a different constellation of players and a different set of rules. 
Uh, so I'm just going to pick out some of the key kinds of partnerships uh, needed to fill the gaps and provide some examples where I can. Uh, firstly, the role of public-private partnerships in delivering health services for NCDs. Uh, there was a really good session on yesterday that gave some very good examples of this from the Defeat NCD Partnership. Uh, and then another example comes from the Coalition of Access to NCD Medicines and Products that brings together civil society organizations like the NCD Alliance and PATH with um, uh, private sector companies, the IFPMA, and academic researchers. And it, it, for example, has supported governments in Kenya and Uganda by developing a tool for uh, that enables forecasting of needs for NCD medication uh, and products to help supply chain management. Uh, thinking more broadly, uh, partnerships are also thinking across health issues. Uh, as NCD Alliance has argued in our recent report, uh, we need to move from silos to synergies. Again, I, th I think people have already re re referenced this about uh, we need to embrace the fact that health is a human right and address the fact that more people are living with multiple diseases that are often chronic and lifelong. Uh, in the case of AIDS and HIV, for example, thanks to increased access to um, an uptake of uh, antiretroviral treatment, people are living longer. But this means we're seeing a rising rate of comorbidities, both due to greater susceptibility to certain NCDs like diabetes, certain cancer and hypertension, but also due to longer and greater exposure to risk factors. In the 2021 political declaration on HIV and AIDS, the UN member states pledged to ensure that 90% of people living with HIV are at risk of and affected by have access to NCD prevention and care services by 2025. And this is re re reflected, for example, in the Global Fund strategy, but we're still, however, to see that reflected in actual funding decisions. So in September, the NCD Alliance sent an open letter to the Global Fund Board, and I'm happy to say that this was co-signed by key stakeholders from the AIDS community, such as Stop AIDS. Um, and this brings me on to the fact that we need partnerships to ensure effective, um, sufficient and sustainable funding. And that's going to require blending income uh, from a range of different uh, public and private sources, uh, tax, obviously, community health insurance schemes, international development si systems, the private sector and philanthropies. Um, and it's also important that governments should be encouraged to lead the reform of UHC policy, working with the meaningful engagement of people living with the diseases, effective populations uh, and civil society organizations. And there was a good example of that, uh, but from the Africa CDC, who uh, consulted people living with NCD through consultation workshops in the development of their NCD injuries and mental health strategy. Uh, and finally, I want to just talk about some of the general rules or key ingredients for successful partnerships for UHCs and NCDs. Uh, partnerships must be in the public interest, uh, be country led, aligned with government priorities, uh, addressing where the identified gaps and challenges are, that is driven by de demand, not by supply. Uh, they should be have specificity of, uh, of purpose and mutuality of interest. And when it comes to public-private partnerships, there can be challenges of conflicts of interest, and hence it's really important to establish uh, and enforce strict engagement principles that manage conflicts of interest, um, ensure transparency, limit private sector involvement in policy making, but really try and get the benefit and ensure their engagement in, the, um, in policy implementation. Um, we want to take particular care around industries responsible for producing and marketing unhealthy commodities that are NCD risk factors, tobacco, alcohol, high fat, salt, sugar and ultra processed food and those responsible for air pollutants. Uh, the recent example of Coca-Cola becoming a sponsor for the Climate COP27 mm -hmm. is a really good case in point of this, the challenges of those kinds of partnerships. Uh, as the protesters outside this conference made clear yesterday, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and we really don't need the sponsors of a, a obesity epidemic uh, greenwashing through climate policy sponsorship. 
And within the universal health coverage, uh, the most challenging part is equity. We should leave no one behind. Partnerships need to place a sharp focus on equitable access and start from the most marginalized groups and build from there. And finally, um, we need strong monitoring and evaluation to measure impact, uh, particularly with a view of disaggregated data that helps demonstrate the true impact. But we also need independent evaluation uh, of the partnerships and the pilots and the, and, the, and the innovation to provide usable and citable evidence that can be used to support scaling up. Thank you. Alison, thank you so much uh, for your insights. You know, while I was feeling optimistic after Louise, I'm now feeling extremely depressed about our chances <laughs> to reach UHC 2030. I think we all need to align. I think partnership is uh, critical and partnership across the board. One essential partner so far uh, in NCDs, and I think it's a, a, a great partner, but it's not right that this is the essential partner and that needs to change is the private sector. And the private sector has been instrumental catalyst in addressing NCDs. But uh, as you said, there is no way the private sector can be doing everything. And the uh, ocean of needs is never going to be uh, uh, managed by private sector. In that respect, I'm really happy to now to turn to uh, uh, Sandrine. Uh, uh, Sandrine uh, comes from uh, Boutier Streff, comes from Sanofi. And uh, in your view, Sandrine, what do you see as a responsibility of private sector to, uh, to, to work this UHD 2030 goal? And uh, do you believe that those commitments are uh, the responsibility of private sector? And uh, how does private sector demonstrate uh, uh, this commitment? to universal health access. Andrine, over. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Hello, everyone. So I, I would like to start, as Louis did, by the population and the patient first. Um, it is obvious that um, there is a clear change in the way that we need to see the patients. Um, if we want to reach a universal health coverage, uh, we have to focus on engaging both infectious disease, so tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, but also on NCD, non-communicable disease, as diabetes or cardiovascular hypertension and so on, cancer as well. Most of patients are not suffering only from NTDs, but they can suffering from diab of diabetes as well. So we need to consider the patient as a, a holistic patient and holistic disease and so to reach these patients with different solutions but at the same time and not in, in, a, in a siloed way. Um, we need also to consider the patient in the context. It's not a matter of south or north. It's not a matter of low in, middle income countries and high income countries. It's about underserved population. It's about patients who are in need. And so it's a shift that we have to engage. And, and I must say that uh, to be honest in the pharma industry, Historically, we have not been so much invested in low and middle income countries or access to healthcare for underserved population. Um, this part, it, it is changing. And so maybe thanks to the COVID crisis, most of private sectors company understood that not only the increase of inequalities to access to healthcare is there, but more to come. The situation is worsening. And if we do not act now, if we do not move forward now, it will, should be, it could be a disaster. Um, so just to illustrate with what we have done at Sanofi two years ago, we are 18 months ago, we have launched a new initiative, which is named Global Health Unit, which is a new uh, business for Sanofi, if I may say, but it is a not-for-profit business because we understood that we need to deliver medicine, but as a pharma company, we want to play our part in order to reach a universal health coverage in many countries. And Global Health Unit is delivering more than 30 life-saving medicines, and particularly for non-communicable disease, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular, and so on, NTDs as well, but also uh, to build uh, um, a new way of working with communities. So we are aiming at uh, improving uh, education in those countries or in communities we want to serve by educate patients with more prevention, by educating also healthcare professionals, oncologists, radiologists, in order to accompany and to support the patients 
where the patient is living. And so we are also at working with governments in order to shape maybe new ways of thinking healthcare system in the country in a sustainable way. Sustainable is very important. It's not a one shot. If we are there just to develop one shot, deliver, and that's all, it's not efficient. We need to think differently. So the sustainable way of delivering medicine and delivering healthcare as a holistic approach is absolutely key. So this is one way uh, uh, what uh, we, we are working. And so for sure, um, uh, healthcare industry and private sector can support uh, universal healthcare. Um, we are uh, uh, coverage um, in different ways. But before moving to those different ways, I would like to share with you few feelings that we have. Despite strong and tangible proof that the public and private partnership are playing a key role in order to deliver access to health care, access to health and universal health coverage, we must say that there is a, a kind of reluctance to partner with pharma industry. It looks like a lack of trust in those kind of industry. I must just remember a very uh, recent experience that we all faced with the COVID. The pharma industry succeed to develop, to manufacture, to deliver vaccines and products for COVID-19 in a very short delay. So too much for sure, but so the pharma industry and the product sector is able to reach uh, some goals which were unexpected before. Mm. So. Having said that, how a, a, a private sector can support the universal health coverage? So first, we are delivering products for sure, but we can do more. This is what I mentioned. We can have a holistic approach. And in our companies, in private sector, there are people who are skilled in digital healthcare. We are skilled in uh, artificial intelligence, aiming at uh, reaching uh, the patients wherever he is, aiming at anticipating a new, a new disease in some specific communities or part of the world. We have people who are expert in uh, uh, project management, uh, in uh, uh, for sure, in, in, in healthcare. And so we have different expertise in logistics as well. So we have a lot of people on the field. We can come back with experiences that we need in order to ensure the success uh, of, uh, of, the, of the universal health coverage. Um, Private sectors and particularly pharma industry is also fully embedded in the healthcare ecosystem. So we have a lot of knowledge in the way that we can connect the dots and articulate a partnership and relationships between uh, organizations such as uh, NCD Alliance, which such as uh, uh, governments, institutions, payers, service providers, but also patients associations because patients is at the the earth of the system. And if we don't hear the patient, we won't succeed as we could expect. So we have a, a such, a, such expertise. So reaching a universal health coverage private uh, uh, partnership is absolutely key, but we know that we can't do alone. We need to work uh, with uh, uh, um, a different uh, uh, organization. And most of the time, when we think about uh, um, access to healthcare, we used to think traditional model. We think we need to work with governments, associations, NGOs, academics, other farmers. But how could we innovate? And innovation is a very important topic. How could we innovate in order to better deliver the last mile? Could we work with other companies such as FedEx or DHL or companies who are delivering uh, consumer or service uh, goods in those same countries they used to do, how we can benefit for their experience to do so. Innovation is also important in digital, for example, if we want to monitor uh, uh, the health of the population remotely because they are very far, digital is the right solution. How we can develop solution adapted to the local context with private company who used to do in order to create this new momentum and coalition in order to better serve the patients. So um, I, I would finish just with a, 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 a fit, food for thought, if I may say, on how we can accelerate and better reach a patient in order to have a universal health coverage 
is about innovation. I truly believe that innovation is absolutely key. How we can serve differently, how we can de deliver differently, how we can innovate to find solution in order to allow healthcare services available where there is a need. Maybe the solution is there, the solution is not new, but we do not think about these solutions, how collectively we can think differently, how we can repurpose the way that we need to deliver and serve the patient in order to allow a more efficient and effective uh, solution for the patients. Mm. Thank you so much, Sandrine. I think indeed private sector has a critical role to play in the overall UHC ecosystem. And like with every partner, uh, we all have to be realistic with what can be expected uh, across sectors and their transparency, understanding and trust uh, is essential uh, for a successful partnership. And I think uh, often when engaging in those private-public private, private partnerships, we uh, uh, fail to realize that uh, uh, both parties have their own impediment and their own agenda, and we need to be knowing each other if we want. It's a bit like a marriage, you know, you, you need to know each other if you want it to be successful. Anyway, I'll now uh, jump to you, uh, Lois, Assistant Secretary of Global Public Affairs in the US Department of Health and Human Services, many H for French speaking person. <laughs> so, so, Lois, you've heard everyone uh, across the sector talk about their roles, their challenges, their mm -hmm. opportunities. Uh, and I'd really like to have your perspective uh, from a major donor standpoint and a major supporter uh, of UHC. Do you agree with the comments that you heard the suggestion? Do you have other viewpoints, and if you can share an example of what you've seen working and what you've seen not working so mm -hmm. well, it would be great. Finally, you know, really would like to hear from you how international aid can fit into that mm. uh, broad ecosystem. Okay, I will do my best. And yes, I was taking notes and otherwise listening attentively. Thanks for all the contributions and thanks, of course, for putting on this particular session, um, I'm really excited about it, um, partly because I've touched each of these areas in my own way and I go way back with a couple of people on this stage, um, but also because my government, the US government is has recently um, stepped up in this space and been quite clear about our commitment to UHG in a way that I think is new for people to hear from us, right? We were very happy to sign on uh, with the friends of UHG and of course have supported previous high level meetings, but I think we're going to approach the meeting next year again um, with an elevated uh, position and commitment uh, to this work. So applauding everyone who has been involved to date and frankly, who has um, helped get the US government to this point, because I think to your to your question, um, it is quite important for us to be at the table with you trying to solve this problem. Now, what do I think about it? I do have some opinions, um, and uh, that's partly because I spent a lot of time outside of government um, before I came in, into government uh, rallying for the same causes. And so some of this, I think, is blended um, or otherwise informed by that experience. But I even look at how we are sort of titling or communicating this session, right? We talk about the road to UHC, which is still quite relevant. But Gabriella, to your point, it's really, for me right now, about the road back to UHC. Like you said, we were really gaining a lot of momentum in this space. It was really exciting 2019 to reach that point. We had Dr. Tedros and others um, behind us. And then it felt like it ground to a halt to some degree. Um, this this energy behind this issue, even though obviously with what we've been living through with COVID-19, it's all the more relevant. And so getting back to this point where not just the people in this room, but the, everyone we're trying to move outside this room understands the issue, I think is, is really critical. And uh, I, I draw from what Mike Ryan always says, right? The the last mile of health delivery is the first mile to health security. So. Is that a way for us to connect the dots or otherwise build the bridge back to what people are so focused on today? One of my fears, honestly, and this is speaking as someone who spends all her time in government now, for better or worse, is that the entire conversation 
is going to be about health security and it's going to be just very hard to pull it back to why we're here. It should be about saving lives, right? Of course, we want to prevent emergencies and disasters and all of the terrible things that we've endured, we continue to endure um, uh, in these past months and in months to come. But really, we could have fared better if we had paid attention to this issue more than we had before the crisis hit, right? And that's the reality for so many communities in so many countries around the world um, who have never gotten attention um, for, for the issues we're discussing around UHC and the, and the critical components of UHC. So that's that's my, my, my first sort of thought is how we, how we make those connections. I think there's some explicit ways too we can build that bridge. So when you think about um, the mantra um, from the G7 about surveillance and data and how we just do a better job, again, knowing what's coming. And we're, it's that's gone beyond the G7, right? That's been something that um, we've been hearing across all WHO member states. Um, what does it look like for us to talk about how achieving uh, or improving UHC can help solve that problem? What are the platforms, for example, um, that could be brought uh, to bear to support the work of pandemic preparedness or surveillance if we build it through um, better UHC or if we do it by achieving UHC? Similarly, we can think about the workforce, right? And we all know, many of you probably are in this room, um, you know, we know how burned um, and frankly traumatized our workforce has been. We've lost a lot of health workers and a lot of them feel left unprotected, um, uh, unappreciated, right? How do we come back to this story through UHC um, to say, look, if we can improve the health workforce, we can shore up our readiness for the inevitable um, local, if not global health emergency. I know workforce is something that we are quite focused on now as an administration, recognizing how critical health workers are, thanks to you all, um, as a bedrock um, to, again, not just health delivery, but explicitly health security. And one of the things the president has done is on top of the more than a billion dollars investment that we have been making across uh, agencies like the CDC or USAID, he's asked Congress for an additional billion dollars moving forward, right? So that we can, again, not just sustain, but improve and even elevate the global health workforce. And so uh, my boss, Secretary Javier Becerra, uh, back at the America Summit that the U.S. hosted, made this, um, this commitment uh, to the Americas region and said, okay, building on what the president has said, we want to help working with PAHO. We want to help train um, up to 500,000 health workers in the region. And that's just not uh, community health workers or medical providers, we're talking about lab techs, we're talking about epidemiologists, we're talking about the range of uh, individuals required to keep this engine running um, in this part of the world. Similarly, we've had conversations with the Africa CDC, um, building on our existing partnership with them and knowing that it dovetails with what they would like to see in their region, right? Um, and under their leadership. So that is another way I think that um, we can again bring UHC um, back into this prevailing conversation. I was also really encouraged to hear people talk about equity um, and how to just continue focusing on that, um, especially um, given again in the wake of COVID, people cannot deny um, prevailing disparities. Um, people cannot deny um, social and other determinants of health. Um, and so how do we talk about that? And again, use UHC to help solve this problem for people who are now maybe only thinking of it in terms of health security, um, but need to widen that aperture to understand that health equity is not just relevant to how we get vaccines or therapeutics for COVID or monkeypox or Ebola around the world, but health equity is just central to health outcomes. And you know, there was a question that came up in another session at which I spoke today that asked about how we address 
not only equi inequity between countries, but also uh, inequity within countries. And I wanna thank the person for asking that question because I don't think we talk about that enough in global settings. And if we just look at the US as an example, I mean, I think most people in this room know how pervasive health disparities are. And so it presents an opportunity for this community in rallying around UHC and using equity as a lens to again, help solve this critical problem for countries and even bring in new stakeholders who might not be as plugged into the global space, but absolutely want to close gaps within their borders um, when it comes to those, those health outcomes. I also heard you, Allison, and also you, Sandrine, talk about who's around the table, right? Um, and I mean, th this panel is a great demonstration of who is at this table. Um, but Allison, you in particular um, talked about something you know I care a lot about and I worked a lot on back in the day, which is people living with fill in the blank, right? And in our case, it was people living with NCDs, but we've also worked with people living with HIV. Unfortunately, now you have so many people living with long COVID or however we're um, framing that condition. But I, I wanna focus on people, not just because it's a great soundbite perhaps, but because I maintain even within government and maybe especially within government that UHC still lacks the face that we need. Um, you know, the U.S. just hosted the Global Fund Replenishment, and it was quite clear from advocates on that issue, and again, people living with HIV or otherwise affected or at risk for it, um, that we could not fail in that effort. And I am still not hearing or feeling that fervor coming um, or building around UHC. And I don't think it's the fault of anyone in this room, but I feel like we still need to somehow marshal um, our collective, your collective resources, right, across those communities and really ensure that that voice builds in such a powerful way. I mean, just think about it, right? If they, if those voices can be so loud on HIV or cancer, right, what happens when these communities come together? And it was great to see that letter come through because I do sit on the Global Fund Board and I thought, yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's how we have to be moving in these spaces, right? We've connected these got dots intellectually, but I think demonstrating that more and rallying outside these halls is, I mean, I'm not going to tell advocates how to do their jobs. I know better than to do that, but I think that would be quite welcome. And I think that that would be, that would be felt and heard um, by people like me. Um, I guess the, the final comments I want to make are around then what these, um, what these allies or advocates really are rallying for. And, um, you know, sure, I talked about the, the initial messaging to get us back to UHC, but ultimately what are we trying to achieve? And I really um, am grateful for what, you, what, our, um, what the gentleman from Ghana said about how we can get wrapped up in costs or even services, I might argue, and not outcomes. And this is where I have to challenge Luis a little bit. And we just met a couple of weeks ago. So sorry. <laughs> but you know, I I do know, having lived it, that our urge is to say, is to insert our issues alongside UHC. And I still think that's going to be important to get your communities on board, but I want to be sure that it doesn't stop at saying, all right, well, how many sort of cancer meds or drugs for hypertension and diabetes or how many innovations for NTDs get brought to the table and have that be our only metric of success when it comes to UHC. I want to be sure that your communities are also pointing to ultimately what we see as success, which I think is saving lives. You know, how many people are living versus dying? How many people are thriving versus surviving? That to me has to be what we're focused on when it comes to this particular issue. And we, we again, we know it, but do we say it often enough or do our communities revert to what they really, really want, right? And what and what what will count for them. So it turns into the ornaments on the tree that I think people hear me talking about and not necessarily the presence underneath it, right? So I think we can do both. And obviously people need to feel and see themselves in the issue, but I think communities like yours have to hold hands and 
know, again, ultimately what success looks for you all collectively and believe that, right? And convince people like me of that so that we can all be pushing towards that end. So that's, those are my reflections based on what I heard. I hope that it was helpful. Um, I am, you know, I will say I remain open to your thoughts as to how we can show up and do better um, and, and invest in a way that will advance this issue for you because we ultimately do trust the people in this room um, to guide us to know more than anyone um, what's required in this space. But again, sincere thanks to everyone here who has been waving the flag or I should say the umbrella for, for UHC, um, especially at such a critical time when we've had crisis upon crisis, you know, these this sustained sense of emergency has not been easy for an, for anyone, I know. And it's very easy, all too easy to, you know, forget the fundamentals. And so uh, know that you know, we appreciate you continuing to lift up this issue, uh, continuing to shore up this work and just keep us honest when it comes to what we ultimately want to see for the world. Thanks again. Lois, thank you so much. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for uh, your comments. I agree with you. We need to go back to the fundamentals. And you articulated that very well. The fundamental, this is people. This is our communities. And this is uh, what we need to serve. And it's not just about emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. It's about building systems that are serving people, resilient systems that are going to be able to cater to population needs and not uh, uh, just uh, our perceived needs. So thank you so much for your openness and asking for feedback. And actually, I'm now going to uh, turn to the audience. I'm sure you... I, I didn't even open it yet. <laughs> and I, I'm sure there's plenty of questions. So we're going to uh, uh, take questions. Please uh, uh, make your remarks brief, uh, introduce yourself, uh, uh, ask your question, and uh, we will take three questions at a time and then move to the panelists for answer. So can you, uh, I think there's this gentleman and that lady there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is, is Aras. Uh, I'm a brain physiologist and president of Kurdistan Health Summit in Kurdistan region. Um, Gabriela mentioned that new partnerships are important. Uh, Peter said partner partnership is the key. Luis Pizarro said neglected diseases replaced by neglected population is I see, I see all of this. Uh, you all mentioned that partnerships are important. We have people in our region that we focus on uh, in Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and these countries of Middle East. We have people dying because of uh, lacking of uh, MCD uh, um, medicines. We have people uh, dying because of stroke because of the, because they don't have medicine is of uh, hypertension, for example, anti-hypertension medication is. We have Kurdistan Health Summit, and we are focusing for the next year on this area. I invite you all to Erbil to Kurdistan region of Iraq. We have a very delicious food, and you will like it. And I invite you to a new partnership because you all said that partnership is very important. We can have a partnership together and focus on our region as well, Iraq, Iran, sometimes Turkey, uh, Syria, um, and these, these countries. We are open and happy to have you there online. And if not possible, if, if on-site is not possible, on-site is better because of Dolma, the Kurdish food. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I wrote this down to ensure that I will remain brief. Uh, my name is Jamie and I'm a population health data scientist at the Global Disability Innovation Hub. We are based in London. 
Um, I focus on access to the life-changing assistive products and services that support people with disabilities. And often these products are not included in or provisioned for in health systems, or they're provided in very minimal ways to very narrowly defined groups of people. By the WHO's own estimate, 90% of those in need of assistive products do not currently have access to them. And this is a pre-COVID estimate. So my question is, when we plan universal health coverage policies and are pushed to define on paper exactly what constitutes health care, how do we uphold inclusivity and ensure that coverage is comprehensive for a diversity of needs? Thank you. What, one more and then we'll uh, answer. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, hello, my name is Karl Puchner. I'm a technical advisor from Policy Cures Research. Thank you very much for the very interesting inputs. I would like to make a comment slash question. Um, it was very encouraging to see that all of you think that the dichotomy of uh, communicable, non-communicable diseases is obsolete. And the real life setting where this is very evident is primary health care. And primary health care is also, if you like the field, the battlefield where universal health coverage will fail or succeed. So I would like to have your thoughts on how we could, uh, if you see uh, a role and uh, fostering of, of primary health care as essential for uh, achieving universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, for further questions, I might ask if you take your mask off. I don't know if it's COVID friendly, but, but I think it would be better for, for us to hear. But I think I heard the question. Your invitation is duly noted. Uh, uh, on the um, what con constitutes uh, healthcare package and healthcare priorities, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to, to take that. I was Peter, Peter do, you, do, you, do you want to take that and uh, uh, how, you know, PNDS are done and... Uh... Yes, um, thank you very much. I mentioned the essence of cost-effective primary health care, uh, priority interventions and services. I think several economic evaluation studies have pointed out to the need that most of the disease burden that we have are avoidable. I mean, in a, especially in sub-Saharan African context. Um, unfortunately, the architecture of our health system is rather couch and sick care with little or no incentives for disease prevention and health promotion. Uh, this has been recognized by my own government, Ghana, government of Ghana and the Ministry of Health. So we've come out with essential package of health services, which recognizes the need for primary health care. Uh, once again, this is at the policy level, and one of the things that we, we, we are very good at, at formulating policies, recognizing the need, formulating policies, certainly it will involve investments, investment, primary health care, I mean, is a great sense of entitlement, it requires investment at all levels, so the need for it is beyond question, however, Oftentimes, government have had to come with certain limits, constraints for parsimonious reasons to limit expenditure. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if we don't invest in primary health care, that vicious cycle of higher disease burden, poverty, will continue to recur. So I couldn't agree more with you. It is a reality. It must be the pathway, especially in lower and middle income countries. It is rather an investment for high productivity in our system. Yesterday, we heard the, the, the research director saying that health must not be seen as a cost. It must be seen as investment. It must not be seen as an outcome of any you know, socioeconomic policy. It should rather be seen as a means. And I think that primary health care interventions and priorities should be the pathway. I take this as advocacy. I take this as call for investment. And definitely, I subscribe to the value of very inclusive benefit package incentivize primary health care services that are, I mean, that are mainstreamed into the service delivery package of our health system. That would be the pathway for strengthening or rebuilding, I mean, a resilient, robust, responsive health system in our countries. There's no question about that. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. 
On, on the uh, need of primary health care and what role for primary health care uh, is there, uh, Gabriela or Lois, one of you would like to take that? Well, primary health care is precisely the foundation of universal health coverage. And once we understand the role of universal health coverage, then we understand that then it comes as part of it, all issues related to pandemic preparedness, for example, or health security, as Lois was mentioning, we cannot lose our focus. It is about placing people, about placing the person at the center of all decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's the principle, the principle of UHC. If we are able to uh, deliver health services, let's close our eyes for three seconds, but ju just let us imagine what would happen if we are able to warranty quality health services to all people everywhere. But we can also take a look to the other scenario in 2030, if we are not able to have UHC, then we, end, we are going to continue having half of the total world's population without access to quality health services. That means that we are going to be equally exposed to a pandemic, that issues related to health security are going to be meaningless. So, for next year, 2023, where we are going to have three UN high level meetings related to health, we need to understand that concept of partnerships. And that means that UHC has to act as an umbrella, but without losing sight and awareness of all these specific diseases that needs visibility, that needs more information, that needs prevention and treatments, that's why we insist so much in, in terms of partnerships and in terms of a primary health care as the foundation of UHC, especially for the next year uh, high-level meetings, because we truly believe that's the moment to renew our commitment. We cannot lose track or enthusiasm. We have to learn the lessons from the tragedy. Come on, it was 18 million people's dying yeah. uh, because of the pandemic. And I was actually pulling up um, the the Astana Declaration, right? I mean, we, before COVID, we also celebrated 40 years since uh, uh, UHC. And I will speak closer. I'd like to model that you can actually speak with your mask on. So I can be closer to the microphone if that helps people hear me. Um, but uh, feel free to, to keep that on for me. And, and I appreciate people who are who are masking up uh, in protection of themselves. Um, so I was just saying that I pulled up the, the declaration um, on PHG um, from 2018, which reads, we are convinced that strengthening PHG is the most inclusive, effective, and efficient approach to enhance people's physical and mental health, as well as social well-being, and that PHG is a cornerstone of a sustainable health system for UHG and health-related SDGs. So it's there, um, and we've made that connection, and I do think to your question, we should continue con making that connection and not forgetting the commitments that have been made and the fact that we do need a strong primary health care system that addresses the range of issues that people are talking about here today and that we know people face all around the world every day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Just one one quick re additional remark on NCD and then we'll need to actually close. I'm just addressing that question about um, packages of treatments. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the WHO's Best Buys packages, which is a, a package of 16 uh, cost-effective and effective treatments, which they're, they're recommending for NCDs, and particularly around prevention and screening and simple treatments. And when we talk about investments, the modelling on that shows that for every dollar invested in the, in the Best Buys, governments would get a, um, a $7 return on that investment. Uh, and a more recent uh, package from the Lancet Commission uh, on the NCD countdown uh, looked at a, a package of 21 interventions, which went more into treatment, and they pr presented a one in 19 return on investment. So it's really there's strong evidence out there about this being an investment, not a cost. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. And let's not forget that actually primary health care is a first entry point for most patients. And yet this is the least uh, funded part of the health pyramid. Luis, I'm going to now turn to you for uh, a closing remark and recommendations. About yeah, one minute thank each. you. Um, I mean, I think there is something really key here. It's uh, governance. Uh, and governance, uh, I would like to highlight that, uh, let's say, at three levels. First of all, uh, at the PHC level, at the community level, uh, because, and I think I insisted saying why we were talking about neglected population, uh, more than diseases, and why the R&D we do need to address what the population are asking. So it's not really about, as you said, I'm free agreed number of drugs coming or whatever, but how those population that are neglected uh, by the communities, by the governments, sometimes by the, the international community, uh, you know, we are able to address the need uh, they have and to integrate them uh, into those health systems. Uh, and I think we have there uh, a first level of, of governance to improve, to make communities be really actors of uh, this primary health care. Uh, a second level, uh, I would say it's at the at the national level uh, and how uh, today governments are able to uh, manage with different stakeholders from public, from private, etc. And on what you said about the, the pharma, uh, for instance, uh, engagement here uh, that has been absolutely key for diseases like sleep and sickness and the collaboration we had with Sanofi and Sleep and Sickness to make that today a reality. It's absolutely, uh, I would say, fantastic. But at the same time, we know that in other cases, maybe it has not been exactly the same situation. And so having transparency in the way we work, being clear on what are the access, uh, you know, milestones and why we are all together addressing those access issues for everybody uh, brings also, you know, more power to the governments when they do that. And then the last one, it's at the international level. Here, we have been talking a lot about governance for the pandemic preparedness response. But there is not only pandemic preparedness situation. I mean, we are all facing uh, in our daily life so many other aspects that we need also to address uh, with governance and architecture, this new global health architecture we want to put in place. So please, let's try not to limit to the pandemic preparedness one and bring, uh, you know, something more large. Thank you, Luis. We've been shown the five minute sign. So, uh, Sandrine, for very quick closing remarks. Yes, very quick. So, um, we see uh, today, this afternoon, that there is a clear momentum and willingness in order to move forward and to accelerate access to healthcare and to reach uh, the target of universal health coverage. Uh, the momentum is there. Now, uh, the ambition is there. Now we may need to shift the ambition into action. And so there are a lot of initiatives across the world which are existing. We need to capitalize. We need to learn and to accelerate collectively. When I say collectively, it's very strong. Uh, the approach in order to make it happen in the next years. And we are almost in emergency mode in order to give access to everyone in the world. Thank you, Sandrine. Alison? Thank you. Um, I was really struck by what Louis said about um, UHC lacks a face mm -hmm. uh, and about the piece about political will. And I think the, the thing that I'm walking out of here thinking about is about the advocacy mm -hmm. and how we get strong messages and strong voices about this being about health for all. Um, and that, you know, UHC is just three letters. Let's, let's talk about it from the heart and about people. Thank you. Peter? Yes. I'm an optimist and also a realist. <laughs> At the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw global solidarity and equity being demonstrated. Let's seize the momentum at that peak mm. to harness the power of effective partnership by recognizing the voice of key stakeholders, duty bearers, and rights holders. Let's recognize the value of partnership by intentional engagement, meaningful innovations, and certainly that is a pathway. If we are to scale up efforts to ensure universal access to equitable, affordable quality health services to all and leave no one behind, partnership is a pathway, but we need intentional partnership and new narrative of accountability 
for health outcomes. Definitely, universal health coverage is achievable by the year 2030. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Lois? Everything they've already said. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gabriella. Well, I would like to, to give you two invitations. The first of, uh, is when uh, to join us for the celebration of UHC Day on 12th December. Uh, this year campaign theme will be the world we want, building a healthy future for all. So please join us. And the second invitation is that it is not enough to have these wonderful conversations. Let's work together for a real implementation to bring all these wonderful ideas to the country and community level, because I'm sure that all our passion and hearts and brains here are enough to change the world. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, thank you to you all. Thank you to the panelists. It's been, it's been an amazing conversation and gave us great hope that together, by partnering, by being clear about the objectives and having the patient focus in mind, we can actually achieve UHC. Let's turn actually goodwill into action. Thank you very much.